I'm Suzanne Madsen from the English Department, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's reading, sponsored by Poetry Days and the Lowell Humanities Lecture Series. Uh, before we get to tonight's event, I'd just like to give you a preview of some coming attractions. The next event in the Humanities Lecture Series is actually a double header. I think this is a first, Paul, is it not? I believe so. Uh, on Wednesday, March 12th, Bell Hooks will speak on Class Matters mm. at 6 p.m. in Gasson 100. Then at 7.30 on the same night, Jonathan Lear will talk about the therapeutic action of psychoanalysis in Devlin 100, this room. Looking ahead to more poetry, on April 10th, the poet Erica Funkhauser will read from her work in this room at 7.30. Both Robin Becker and Erica Funkhauser began their poetry careers with first books published by Alice James Books. This year, Alice James Books celebrates 30 years of continuous independent poetry publishing, and in honor of that extraordinary anniversary, I want you to know that both Robin Becker and Erica Funkhauser are donating their honoraria for their evening readings to further the work of Alice James Books, a nonprofit press. So, thank you. Tonight, we welcome Robin Becker, author of five collections of poems, a selection of which will be available after the reading for buying and signing, and a professor of English and Women's Studies at Pennsylvania State University. Her book, All American Girl, was the winner of the 1996 Lambda Literary Award, and she has received fellowships in poetry from the Bunting Institute, the Massachusetts Artists Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Becker has been a visiting scholar at the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies at the City University of New York and serves as poetry editor of the Women's Review of Books. In her poem, In Praise of the Basset Hound, Becker writes, This unlovely dog with warts and a terrible stink common to the breed, legless as a walrus, teaches me to pursue my life with devotion. I am struck by that and other instances of simple humility in Becker's work, a stance of appreciation encompassing everything from the raccoon eating her garbage to the art of Durer to the mute but sturdy company of the body training itself to approximate downward-facing dog in <laughs> yoga class. A gentleness guides this poet's observations so that the starkness of certain histories, a child killed by her mother's boyfriend, for example, are all the more painfully felt as the poems face them unflinchingly. Becker's ability to project herself into a painting, the voice of a Jewish child in Berlin in 1930, the life of an urban neighborhood or a retirement community, is metaphoric in the truest sense, a carrying across of meanings through times, realms, ethnicities, genders, and generations. It is in this carrying across that her generosity is important is apparent, her willingness to suspend the particularity of the self in the service of better understanding the other. This understanding is leavened with humor, but it is a delicate humor, a wryness that always feels double in some way, acknowledging that absurdity is the other side of loss, that hope and disillusionment go hand in hand. In Becker's work, feeling is never diverse, divorced from a searching, questioning intellect. The resulting poetry feels true to me, not in an overweening capital T sense of the word, but in its accuracy, its faithfulness to the rendering. Like the painter she admires and has written about, her project is one of study and one of making in the, quote, muslin light, your own temple. Such making is an act of provisional solace and beautiful defiance against the many kinds of deaths each life bears witness to, the cruel, unnecessary deaths, the natural, timely ones. But in the work of Robin Becker, there is no unimportant death, just as there is no unimportant life. For, in the words of the poet, who among us has not been moved by the magnificence of mute creatures in their abundant, dying skin? Please join me in welcoming Robin Becker. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professors Suzanne Matson and Paul Dougherty, for inviting me to join the distinguished list of poets and writers 
who have read in the Lowell Humanities series here at Boston College. When I lived in Boston, I remember coming to those readings, and they meant a lot then. Organizing and planning a hosting and hosting a reading series takes precious time from one's own writing, so I acknowledge the great gift that these professors offer Boston College and the honor they do this community. Thank you both. Okay, Tucker. Okay, Tucker, you win. My arm got tired of throwing the ball before you got tired of scrambling up the river bank to fetch it. Okay, Tucker, you can come too. Since you opened the door with your clever snout, I'm not about to shove you back in. You win the beauty contest the most finicky eater award, and the like a dog with a bone prize. You win the first one in the car sweepstakes. Look, Tucker, we had no choice when we squared off in your adolescence. We had to get along. It was a live and let live situation, both of us in love with her. Okay, I bribed you with biscuits and rides. You conned me with a smile and a handshake. Remember hide-and-seek in the cornfield? The jack in the pulpit? The lady slipper? That week at the beach with smelly gulls wrapped in slime and tangled lines of seaweed? And a pan of chickens? You had it made, but no. Old girl, you chased the phantom squirrel up the slope again and again, returned slack-jawed, refused to come off the porch, stood your ground in freezing November rain, showed your dog's teeth when I showed my human fear, and for good measure ran circles around me when I was her woman, but you were her dog. <laughs> Thank you. Many years ago, my grandmother used to read a paper called The Forward when it was published in Yiddish in New York City. And uh, recently, uh, the person who's serving as the poetry editor for The Forward emailed me and asked me if I had any poems to send to the magazine. And at that time, I, I had, did I have any poems with Jewish content? And at that time, I had no poems with Jewish content. But I was so dismayed at the thought that I didn't that I decided that I was going to write one. Uh, so I wrote one. And here it is. It's called The New Egypt. I think of my father who believes a Jew can outrun fate by owning land. A slave to property now, I mow and mow. My destiny, the new Egypt. From his father, the tailor, my father learned not to rent but to own to borrow, to buy. To conform, I disguise myself and drag the mower into the driveway, where I ponder the silky oil, the plastic casing, the choke. From my father, I learned the dignity of exile and the fire of acquisition. Not to live in places lightly, but to plant the self like an orange tree in the desert, and irrigate, irrigate, irrigate. <laughs> Suzanne and I were discussing earlier today about doing our writing assignments along with our students. And this is a poem that I did along with my students. And the assignment was 10 syllables per line, four, line, four lines per stanza. Uh, here it is, a pasture of my palm. Trembling, desirous, above the display case, I hovered with my child's hand. Beneath, porcelain palominos stamped their feet, 
and foals stood with their long legs splayed. I longed to take one home, to place it on a shelf, and study the raised leg, the frothy mane. Then, cupping the horse's shape in my hand, I'd make a pasture of my palm, a field. No one was looking. No one, I reasoned, would know I swiped it, toy in my pocket. That night, I stroked the caramel china. I was galloping when my mother walked into my room. She knew I was lying. The horse, a gift. I cried when she told me we'd speak with the manager the next day. In his office, I stood, wept, but even then, I was really crying for the cheap horse back in the glass case, my mother, my foolish and punishable desires, the future taking shape, corral, stampede. For those people who haven't had the joy of reading David Ferry's translations of the Odes of Horace, uh, I recommend them. And I wrote this poem as a kind of homage both to David Ferry and Horace. On Friendship After Horace. Come down, M, snarled in another argument. Stop sulking in that tree. If the contractor came late and the worker shingling the barn made a mistake, if the fuel tank in the trucks kaput, if your dead friend's dog won't eat her dinner, carry the box turtle out of the road or pluck a few raspberries from the October garden. Okay, so you have to dig up the dahlias. Still holding a grudge about that trip to Italy, our bad sex life after our good sex life? Darling, must we return to the Tiber and Euphrates? After 20 years of friendship and therapy, we're still lousy at talking to each other. Two middle-aged survivors in an age of non-potable water on Long Island. Lethal viruses housed offshore. The scallop harvest at record Lowe's. Let me recommend Horace, who combined passion with a practical love for the snafu, who accepted the bungler, the perfectionist, the one who must have a pear-shaped glass with a narrow top for aromatic liquors, the two-faced, the evasive, the worried. Horace knew that friendship is neither intermittent nor divisible into parts, but aboriginal discordant, the new music. M, come down from that tree and listen to the apples falling on the tin roof. We've been friends since the cradle of civilization, a pair of foragers watching the deer at midnight sustain themselves on the rotten, the fallen. Winter Pantoum for Carolyn. The second and fourth lines become the first and third lines <laughs> in the next interlocking stanza all the way down. Got it? Winter Pantoum for Carolyn. The cream breast of the hawk glides overhead. Tit mice scatter seeds by the coal bin. Oh, lay me down in the sleep of the dead. In Pennsylvania hills, developers steal in. Tit my scatter seeds by the coal bin. We skied to a field where new houses rose. In Pennsylvania hills, develop developers steal in. On rural roads, the farms foreclose. We skied to a field where new houses rose. On the phantom fence row where creatures hid. Along rural roads, the farms foreclose and land goes for the highest bid. 
on the phantom fence row where creatures hid, you curse the bulldozer and the company men. Where land goes for the highest bid, you count bear and deer among your kin. You curse the bulldozer and the company men, an owl hoots to her mate across the pines. You count bear and deer among your kin, the great horned ignores all boundary lines. An owl hoots to her mate across the pines, you split your wood and stack it by the shed. The great horned ignores all boundary lines and claims the winter sky instead. You split your wood and stack it by the shed, pine tar the skis and leave them on the porch. The owl takes a crow, leaves feathers where it bled. The cream breast of the hawk flies overhead. While we're on formal verse, uh, I'll read a sestina. We were talking a little bit today in the colloquium about writing in formal verse. Um, so to those students who were there earlier, I wrote a lot of sestinas before I got to this one. <laughs> Peter Pan in North America. Mary Martin, leader of the Lost Boys, when you flew across the stage in drag, in your tattered forest suit, teasing hook, some of us recognized you. Girl boy, darling, you refused to grow into any version of manhood while we cheered at the play in New York, 1960. Tomboys pulled from play to put on dresses and sit among the feckless boys. Years later, we cultivated our baby butch versions of Peter before our mirrors. That day, we couldn't drag ourselves from our seats. You liked the play, darling, our knowing mothers asked. We dangled from the hook of their question, the answer as overdetermined as Hook's effeminate ways. Being a boy was best. Second best, we'd play Peter in school plays, flirt with our Wendy darlings, and strap on toy sabers like pirates taking lost boys hostage. After all, Mary Martin could fly, take a drag from a pipe, dance with her shadow, reject predictable versions of femaleness, call it chutzpah or perversion we imagined ourselves. Breasts bound, hooked to guy wires, smartly dressed in roguish drag. We took our own message from the play. If grown-up gendered roles awaited all girls and boys, then woe to her whom he called darling. When the time came, we called each other darling and fell into our own problematic diversions and girl-girl relations. Next door, the gay boys camped it up, swishing around in capes like Hook. Now we've got adult cult artists to play the gender-bending game. We know the world needs drag queens, he, she's, and transvestites at the drag ball. Behind the hetero scrim, Mr. and Mrs. Darling fly erotic creatures of every sexual preference who play havoc with your repressed aversions. Skirt and slip, tank and tights, drop the baited hook and we'll all bite. Girls, boys, everything in between. Drag revealed our own inversions long before the darlings were upstaged by Hook, and grown-up play separated the Marys from the boys. So what were the six words? Uh, hook, drag, boys, darling, hook, drag, 
Boys, Darling, Play, and there's one other one that kept changing. Perversion, Aversion, Diversion, Version, B+. <laughs> I don't know, Suzanne. <laughs> this poem is the title poem from Giacometti's Dog. And for those people who haven't seen the sculpture on which the poem is based, it's a life-size bronze sculpture of a dog that looks like it's starving. It's uh, very thin and scrawny. There's a little graphic on the front of the book, but it's a life-size sculpture of a dog. Uh, that's all. Giacometti's dog. He moves so gracefully on his bronze legs that they form the letter M beneath him. There is nothing more beautiful than the effort in his outstretched neck, the simplicity of his head, but he will never curl again in the comfortable basket. He will never be duped by the fireplace and the fire. Though he has sniffed out cocaine in the Newark airport, we can never trust his good nose again. He'll kill a chicken in his master's yard. He'll corner a lamb in the back pasture. He's resigning his post with the seeing eye. Giacometti's dog will not ask for water, though he's been tied to a rope in Naples for three days under the hot sun. Giacometti's dog will not see a vet, though someone kicks him and his liver fills with blood, though he's fed meat laced with strychnine, though his mouth fills with porcupine quills. Giacometti's dog is coming back as a jackal, snapping at the wheels of your bicycle, following behind in his you can't touch me now, suit. Giacometti's dog has already forgotten when he lost the use of his back legs and cried at the top of the stairs and you took pity on him. He's taking a modern day attitude. He knows it's a shoot or get shot situation. He's not your doggy in the window. He's not racing into a burning house or taking your shirt between his teeth and racing to the beach. He's looking out for number one. He's doing the dog paddle and making it to shore in this dog-eat-dog -dog world. This poem is called Sisters in Perpetual Motion. And uh, ordinarily when I read this poem in Salt Lake City or Riverside, California, I have to explain that the names in the poem are the names of subway stops in Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> but here I don't have to, so I'm happy to read it here. Sisters in Perpetual Motion. Urban wanderers, unhoused and unhinged, they are wrapped in a perpetual motion of paraphernalia, trundling from Kendall to Central, Harvard to Porter. One in a gentleman's greatcoat, worsted gabardine and fur collar, holds a sidebar conference with herself, pushes her metal shopping cart, argues with the invisible censorious judge of Mass Ave. Parallel to traffic, she retains a centrifugal relationship to the lanes she occupies, strides away from the main parent axis of rotation, abjures public transportation or charity, and returns early evening cold, coincident with those of us not charged with a conundrum of streets. She sleeps in undocumented doorways and on grates and in neighborhood parks on benches and propped on soiled cushions, she pushes. 
sponge of pocked foam bedding, torn lining of a brown coat. Thus I remember my sister, her unbuilt days of compulsive walking before she decamped to clinics and psych wards, her walkabouts, her unfettered speech, her terrorist phone calls and the tyranny of her jurisdiction. Thus beleaguered, she engineered a siege and won. Timber up a frame dwelling, I said. Explain yourself to yourself. In the end, the cops broke down the door of an empty house to find her. Yoga. The teacher says to feel the breath flowing up the spine, up the neck, where the vertebrae click in the teeth of the ratchet wheel, where concentration forces spirit upward on the hinged pall of perfect self-control to the crown of the head. Next, the birds come with their bits of straw and fabric and thread. In the pose of the standing tree, I am a patient bodhisattva, enduring a spring rain, content to forego enlightenment and be reborn again and again in the pose of the downward-facing dog, inhaling the fecund April earth with first one, then the other nostril, to practice the sacred shifting of consciousness from mind to mind. In this disciplined exchange of breath, we train for distance runs at altitude, incarnations as mountain cats or Asian trees, our life's breath finding a home in every metabolic niche. Elephant, lotus, monkey, banyan, we bend bows and snouts, balancing the ineffable as it rolls and pitches out of our momentary bodies. In 1999, I embarked on an artistic collaboration with sculptor Sally McCorkle, a professor at Penn State. Uh, we had been asked to uh, create an installation for our university museum, and we decided to research the life and work of the first woman dean of a college at Penn State where we both were teaching. And uh, we already did this in the colloquium, so some people already know the answer. But can you guess what college the first woman dean was the head of? Can anybody guess? I'm, I mean the field, like social work. Social work's a good guess. Even before social work. Home economics. She was the dean of the College of Home Economics, and her name was Grace Henderson. So we decided to go into the archives at our university, and we found all sorts of interesting material. And we ended up with, um, I wrote a series of poems, and she did an installation for the museum. Um, our research took us to uh, all sorts of reading, and um, I'll read you two of the poems from that, from that uh, series. The first uh, is to give a sense of what the field of home economics encompassed. The poem is called Brought Own Bedding and Food. Uh, and the, the poem is a kind of compilation of the names of talks and chapters um, that Grace Henderson uh, gave and wrote. Talks she gave and chapters she wrote for books and articles she wrote. Brought Own Bedding and Food. Welcome to the changing mission of home economics, and welcome to the poverty workshop. 
Welcome to the Land Grant Idea in Contemporary Society, the Interior Design Banquet, and the State 4-H Dress Review. And welcome, Extension Homemakers. Before we proceed, I wish to greet those in the Family Finance Workshop, the Pastoral Counseling Institute, and the Hospital Auxiliary. Welcome to the Laundry Conference. <laughs> Welcome to Omicron New, Iowa Conclave. I'm delighted you could attend today's state training meeting for district officers of federations of women's clubs. We all know the value of the Pennsylvania Dietetic Association. It is my pleasure to serve on the council, the committee, the board, to serve as dean, as department head, to report on women in a defense decade, problems in rural urban research, and how clothing and textiles affect every part of family living. Thank you for inviting me to define a liberating education, to consider high school home economics curricula for boys and girls, and the challenge of being a woman today. Before we begin this morning's session, let's remember the rural mothers who brought their own bedding and food to the first Mother's Vacation Camp, 1925, conducted by the Farm Bureau on the Kiowa Scout facility. So that gives you a sense of the field of home economics. The next poem I will read is a found poem, uh, which means I added nothing. I merely lifted the material from a text and dropped it into my poem. I did rearrange the, the text, uh, but I didn't add anything or take anything out of the actual sentences. The text is a home economics textbook, Guide for Today's Home Living, edited by Hazel Hatcher and Mildred Andrews, D.C. Heath & Company, Boston, 1966. The poem is called... Uh, it's a subheading in the chapter. Qualities boys like best in girls. <laughs> boys like a girl who is alert, full of life, and fun to be with. She doesn't sit on the sidelines and expect to be entertained. A girl who shows friendliness and interest in others attracts boys. They like a girl who overlooks their faults, and makes them feel at ease in embarrassing situations. A girl's appearance is important to boys. A pretty girl catches the eye. Poise, good posture, a sunny disposition, and a fresh, well-groomed look are characteristics boys admire. Hoping to make a more pleasing appearance by using cosmetics, a girl needs to know how to wear makeup without its being overdone or obvious. Punctuality is a trait that makes a hit with boys. A self-conscious boy is apt to feel ill at ease if he has to spend too long a time conversing with the girl's parents. Boys like a girl who is sincere. A girl who is straightforward appeals to boys. Boys dislike a girl who tries to make an impression by prattling on about how much things cost. Boys place a high value on loyalty, too. Boys prefer a girl who shows some intelligence, who knows when to laugh and when to be serious, when to talk and when to listen. Boys like a girl who is modest about her accomplishments. They feel insecure when a girl gives the impression that she is mentally superior to them. I didn't add a word. It was straight out of the textbook. So you can see that early home economics was, was in a way, very, uh, very concerned with gender roles and sex roles and uh, the domestic sphere. And um, we were talking today how, in a way, home economics was an early an early, um, an early site of early women's studies programs, as, as we were talking earlier. Uh, very interesting stuff there. A 
Okay. The last collaboration I did um, involved uh, visiting, as a visiting artist, I was invited by the Frick Art and Historical Center in Pittsburgh to come and study a visiting exhibit that was um, in Pittsburgh from the Albertina in Vienna. In the past, when I'd written about art, I had picked out what art I wanted to write about. This time, I was invited to come to the exhibit and select from the paintings that were in the exhibit. And that was tough, because these were not necessarily drawings and prints uh, that I would select and go to. So uh, I visited the, the exhibition several times, and I took the catalog, and off I went. And the understanding was that uh, at the end of the year, the Frick would print a chapbook, which included reproductions of some of the pieces about which I wrote. So what I want to do now is I'll just do six of the pieces. The, the chapbook has nine poems. But I thought it would be fun to um, look together uh, at, at the slides first. Um, and I have to thank my friend Miriam Goodman for helping me come up with this way of, of showing it to you. First to look at them, just looking at them for 30 seconds each one. And then we'll go back and I'll read the poem. This is Durer's uh, drawing, Head of an Angel, made in 1506. The poem is called Head of an Angel. I've given up trying to decide what Durer intended and accept myself for what I am, androgynous, sublime. Staminate and pistillate my flowers immortal. And maybe that's the point of the artist's invitation to look at the stem of my sinuous neck, the gray ink and white heightening he brushed on my imperishable curls. What I'm listening for, Venetian blue, you infer from my upturned eyes, my mind through which the mind of God is passing. This is called Village Street with a Barn. It was done in 1663 by a contemporary of Rembrandt's named Lambert Doomer. The poem is called Simple Dark. Barn doors open at each end. Inside, animal stink, wood shavings, broad axe, nakedness in the hayloft. To fall in with the simple dark, to finger the wooden hinge, lock, hook, abraded stalls, this feeling your way in the barn of first knowledge, where thought roams, a barn cat. Dreaming you clip lead shank to halter and groom in the drowse of a standing horse whose legs frame a passageway of light. You're drawn to thresholds and overhangs, Corridors of segmented dark sequences, cross hatching and thatch, and outbuilding shadows a figure walking to town on a brown wash, touchstone of summer days. In the village, a cooper makes of oak staved casks, her barn doors open at each end. This piece is by Beham, B-E-H-A-M. And I'm sorry I don't have the date. Uh, it's a 16th century piece. Classical Lines. Ceres scatters flowers and fruit. It must be summertime, she's nude, and not in the mood for company. The sky has a muslin attitude. It must be summer. Her braids come loose. Hair falls to her collarbone. Smoke rises from the temple of her feet to the muslin page where she's at home. She has no age and needs no table. In one raised hand, the harvested wheat. 
from the other grapes and gourds and pears fall down the page, sweet as fragrant plums in the orchard. Say it's late afternoon, summer. You're in the mood for your own company, for the fruit and flowers someone put on your table. The day is an orchard, amble where a muslin light fills the room, where you make your own temple. This is, of course, Rembrandt's Healing the Sick, or the Hundred Gilder print from 1649. My poem is called The Doubters. And before I start, I want to point out that up in this corner, which you can't see, uh, is a camel. Can you just make out his head turned towards the right? He has a halter over his nose. There's a halter over his nose, and his head is turned this way, and there's a man leaning on his hump. Can you just make it out? Oh, good. Okay. The Doubters. The prostrate figure on the litter, bare feet hanging off the cart, Hopes the man from Nazareth is not a hoax, since nothing's worked so far. A townsman in a hat thinks he'll listen for a while, give the man a chance to speak. Gossiping Pharisees gather at the wall, arguing divorce near bald St. Peter, and seated on a slope, the rich young heir in tooled boots won't renounce his wealth or rank. The camel's got a better shot at heaven. Here's an old couple. Her arm supports his. A pair of mittens dangles from his neck. She wants to say her mate's a good man as a mother thrusts her infant up. Blessing? Against the dark, above the praying hands, the lecturer stands, emits a self-reliant calm Few could muster in this circumstance. On his robe, a shadow cast by a beggar shows that he belongs among the turbaned, the doubting, the confused. But the Son of God, who seeks relief, may find belief the better choice. Only the camel driver, preoccupied with getting paid and getting home, ignores the crowd leans on his camel, considers which route he'll take out of town. This is Durer's study with three hands, which he made when he was 22 years old. Uh, the poem is called A Short History of the Hand. The brain, misfiring, packs a cognitive whoop into the grasp. We're arboreal, hoisting hand over hand for a million years, perfecting the insect pluck, the one-handed hang. Then we're upright, knuckling under the group will to cooperate, build, share food, fight. Freed from its quadruped duties, in time, the hand gets into trouble. Once again, the brain's to blame, that confraternity of cells. We mastered the three-fingered chuck, agriculture, the early village, the long-term grooming partner, and music, and the domestication of animals. The artist's hand, cross-hatched with lines, shows a nimble deftness, delightful as good conversation. Wrist, index, saddle joint, water mark of the fingertip. We recognize in the moods of Durer's three hands a graphic speech. His body, 15th century thumb protruding between two fingers. 
sociable knuckles, flexing, obedient, the trusty vernacular palm. He's 22. What touches us, force of the thrust hand's vulnerable flesh, honors the left hand's geniality, its reputation for poor penmanship, its wit. From the cuff of his blousy smock, three times his left hand lectures, charms, provokes, fills up the sheet with a bold pleasure in making itself heard. And the last one, I'll say a few words about this print. Uh, it might be a little difficult to see. <coughs> This print is of the menagerie of Prince Eugene of, Salvo of Savoy uh, in Vienna. It was made in 1732 by Salomon Kleiner, a German printmaker. And he is depicting here what came to be an, known as an early zoo. Uh, so I did a little reading on early zoos and um, found out some uh, very interesting things about how the animals were brought to the zoo. So... Uh, this poem that I'll, I'll conclude with is in the voice of the monkey on the top. It's called Menagerie. Well-traveled subjects of the prince compose tableaus in monarchy's vivarium. The pelican and ocelot repose, the jaguar sleeps, the monkey picks his nose upside down by the herbarium. Our habitats, imperial, contain our wild natures and evoke bits of the day the hunters came and carted us away. This is a charming song, so I won't note conditions of our passage here by boat. They feed us well and decorate our space with antiquities that civilize the place. By turns we cackle and croak and roar like the captive symbols we truly are. Incarceration has a savage face and an impassive one. We don't reproduce. Consider all our centuries adduced. Elephant and camel offer rides, while zoologist likes to categorize, to study trays of horns and heads and hides. A woodsman found a feral child in France. They're teaching him to cook, speak French, and dance. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. wondering um, how you reconcile rhyming or doing any of the, the format the format poems when maybe in order to put it down in format you lose even like one percent of what you want to try to get across. Does that make sense? Say it again. So you know when you rhyme <laughs> or you or you write in a formatted way. Yeah. You know you have this idea that you want to convey but you're gonna like slightly twist what you want to, what you really want to say or how you're really feeling to fit this format or fit this rhyme scheme. And maybe like the idea of poetry is to just get it out 
And like, I feel like format and poetry is really hard to write and completely say exactly what you want to say. So, I mean, we had, the, there's a Sistina in there, and there was rhymed poetry and stuff. So Pantum, right. Yeah. <coughs> All these formats. It's a really interesting question, I think, how you use, how you use received forms and how you use uh, metered poems to say what you really, really want to say. And uh, one thing I've been thinking a lot about this semester is, um, I think it was, I think it was uh, Frost who said that when you stub your toe and you cry out, ah, you're having a genuine experience. It is a very real ex ah, my foot. But when you want to cry out about a real loss or a real hurt, it's the shaping it that Frost says that gives it, that honors it. The, the cry of the stubbed toe is a cry, is a real cry. But the, the honor of the shaping of the work is, in Frost's, in Frost's vision, uh, what honors and dignifies a loss. And I was thinking about that in terms of metered and, um, and formal poetry, in that the compression required to take that emotion, the cry of the stub toe or the cry of loss or the cry of delight, and to shape it into something um, that's distilled, enables us to then pass it on to one another. Um, and so that's really what I'm trying to think about right now in my own work and in my teaching, is how can we take the emotions that we want to work with or the observations that we want to make and find the form that honors it. Sometimes it's not the right fit. I agree with you. Sometimes a particular idea is not the right fit. But recently um, I heard a student of mine read a sonnet that she had written uh, which threaded together, it was a formal Shakespearean sonnet, and it threaded together the experience of childhood abuse and violation with love. So here she was taking a form that we associate with love poetry, and she was talking about a contemporary experience of love and violation woven together, and she did it with such formal restraint. She did it with such elegance that we were stunned by it. And it was a very different experience than we would have had if she had put it in a free verse poem. She put it in a formal Shakespearean sonnet to dignify her own experience. And the whole class was blown away by the choice of the form. So sometimes you can really find the form that honors what you want to say. And sometimes you want to use a free verse form. Good question, really good question. Right on the money, right where a lot of us are thinking every day. You want to jump up to the microphone, sir? Yeah, you do. <laughs> Thanks. Um, what you were just saying reminded me of Wallace Stevens' famous phrase, so the poem's the cry of its occasion. Now, does that apply at all to what you were thinking? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, could you interpret the line? <laughs> well, the occasion, the occasion of wanting to make something of personal experience, so you ask, what shape is the, is the right shape for the cry of that occasion? Yeah. Um, the poem I opened with, the O.K. Tucker poem, the poem, remember that one that I started with? I wanted that poem to have a lightness and a and a wittiness to it. So it's filled with internal rhyme and slant rhyme. And, you know, I was trying to, the cry of the occasion was, how can I get them right on the first poem, right? How can I use all the tools in my toolbox? Um, so even there, it's a free verse poem pretty much on the page. But I'm working every line. I'm trying to have the sound from the previous line echo in the next line. I'm trying to think about how can I have the sentence that's in jammed and then the short stubby sentence that bangs up against it. How can I have the caesar in the middle of the line that catches you up when you think the line's going to run down? So in a sense, even when you're working with a free verse line, all of those same questions of formal dexterity are still yours to ask. Another question, somebody? Yeah? Jump up, Les. That first 
question was so great that I think we can talk all evening about it. Um, but it, the question seems to presume that, uh, that you know what you want to say when you start writing a poem. And uh, in my few lame attempts at things like the Sistina, which is such a uh, complicated form, um, you know, I started with a theme maybe and an impulse, but the form itself led me to the meaning. I didn't um, know where it was going to take me, and that was part of the delight. Uh, so I don't know, if, do you have a comment on that? No, I, I just think that's so true. Uh, <laughs> I do want to say one thing, though, because once I wrote a poem about um, a friend's father based on some story that uh, she told me, and I compared, I don't remember exactly, I don't want to say it because it was wrong, but I compared the father to something, and she read the poem later, and she said, my father's not at all like that. Why did you use that word? And I thought, I used that word because I liked the sound of that word. Mm. And I, hmm. it was a great uh, lesson because I felt very bad afterwards that I had used the word just because I liked the sound when it was the wrong word. And uh, so that was, so I tried not to sacrifice truth for beauty. <laughs> well, I, I guess I part ways with you there. I sacrifice <laughs> truth for beauty, absolutely. <laughs> no, the truth doesn't matter to me. Along. We still get along, but... I much prefer beauty. <laughs> Paul, were you going to say something? This isn't a question, but I was going to ask if you could read another poem. Oh, anyone in particular? Well, Adult Child, of course. Oh, yes, I would love to read that. Yeah, we were just talking about free, ver free verse sonnets, so here's, here's a free verse sonnet. Adult child. Now that my parents are old, they love me fiercely. And I am grateful that the long detente of my childhood has ended. We stroll through the retirement community. My father would like to call the woman who left me and tell her that I will be a wealthy woman someday. <laughs> we laugh, knowing she never cared about money but patiently taught him to use his computer and program his car phone. In the condo, my mother navigates a maze of jewelry, tells me the history of watches, bracelets, rings, and pearls. She says, I may sell most of it. She just wants me to know what's what. I drive her to the bank, where we sign a little card, and walk accompanied into the vault, gray boxes stacked like bodies. Here, she says, are the titles and deeds. Free verse sonnet. But boiled down from lots of writing, boiled down to think, okay, if I, only, I, can, I can only give my father one line in this poem. What should it be? <laughs> right? Trying to you know, force it so that my, my readers are moving along with me and it has wit, it has humor, it has balance. I'm trying to make that 14 lines do a lot. Thank you, Paul, for asking me to read that he one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. How were the responses to the art? <laughs> I'm on sabbatical. I'm not allowed to be teaching. Um, anyway, I was, you know, being an art, I'm, I'm a graphic designer, I'm not a poet, um, and I was interested very much in the response of the art people to the poems, which weren't necessarily, especially that last one, in homage to the work. Because I'm assuming this is a collection they were proud of, you know, that they wanted everyone to come in and, you know, ooh and ah and you know, genuflect in front of. I mean, certainly owning a Rembrandt is no mean feat. There aren't that many to go around. So, I mean, the irreverent one in particular, I'm curious how they... How they uh, well, this is a really interesting question because by the time the book came out and the poems were available, the exhibit was down. <laughs> so, in fact, the people from the Albertina received copies of the chapbook 
but I never saw them after the initial, nice to see you at the opening of the exhibit. And I'm the person who will be writing the poem, so that's very nice. And then a year later when the poems came out, the exhibit was only up for three months. So I didn't have that, that was connection. Was that the original intent? Yeah, yeah. The original intent was that, um, that we would produce the chapbook. And we knew that we knew the exhibit would be down, which is why I asked them to make a set of slides for me so that I could do this. Yeah. Anybody else? Jump up. <laughs> Everyone liked your first one so much. Yes, okay. um, so keep on the line, I think. Um, when you when you when you want to, you, so you have an idea before you do the poem that you want to write. Maybe maybe not. How do you come to the particular form? You mean? Well, I was, I was just going to ask you how you rhyme. Like when I when I if I want to rhyme, my rhyme is just like so bad, so bad. <laughs> like I just like you want to rhyme with roar, you go bore, core, door, floor. I mean, What's your like, name? Greg. Greg. We just sat in my graduate poetry workshop yesterday. And we sat with a student's gozzle, and we made a list of all the words, the rhyming words. We sat, the group of us sat there and did the same thing for her so that she could go back and work on her gozzle with these rhyming words. Sometimes that's exactly how you get them. So you have a line, and you rhyme something, and you work backwards on the next line? Sometimes. Sometimes I think, here's a really interesting word that I have here. How can I have an echo of a sound, even if it's not the exact same sound, similar enough so that it'll stay in your ear from line to line? <laughs> okay, should we go out and sign books? Yes. Okay, thank you again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.